Good morning, everybody. I get to take Valerie's place again this morning. She is at Bella Rose. Say hi to all the folks at Bella Rose. Glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, before we get started, there are, over here as you leave today, there are financial statements as to what the church is doing. Uh, you know, we've got our, our regular income and expenses on here, the overall of what we got in the uh, checking account and what we've got in the building fund, which is a money market account. And it shows a big number on here. But don't let that big number make you think we got a lot of money because once we start building, it's going to go into the millions on the other side. So just remember that when you see $200,000 or whatever it is. But uh, And also, uh, Diane McGann had a heart attack yesterday. And she is not doing well at all. Valerie called the hospital this morning. She's in ICU, and all they could tell her was she is stable, which is, that does not mean a whole lot. But just remember her family. Uh, also, Sylvia and Santana has got cancer. She's doing treatments. Um, so just remember those as we, uh, we, we'll do our prayer request later. But Valerie has this for me to read. This is the voice of the shepherd. And he brings out his own sheep. He goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. That's John 10, 4. Have you ever seen a child who cannot find his mother in a crowd? Although she might be out of sight, the little tyke may still hear her voice. It is almost as though his inner radar scans the sounds around him, looking for that one familiar tone. Did you know Jesus encouraged his hearers who had that same familiarity with the voice of God. In today's passage from the Gospel of John, Jesus likens his followers to sheep under the direction of the great shepherd. In this parallel, we see that only the shepherd can approach the flock without causing alarm. If an unknown intruder were to come near, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> yeah. That's, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. If an unknown intruder were to come near, the sheep would immediately sense danger and the doorkeeper would not open the stable door. Although we see that the sheep follow the shepherd wherever he leads because they know his voice. Just like a child listening for his mother, sheep instantly recognize the shepherd by his voice. Why is this analogy important to us today? It is because we are the sheep of Jesus and Jesus is the shepherd. He entered our flock by stepping into human history, and he calls, calls us to himself by his word and his deeds. Can you hear the voice of the word? Of, can you hear the word of the Lord? He desires to make himself known in your life. If you have trouble hearing his voice, stop and pray for help in quieting the noises of the world, so you can focus intently on the voice of your great shepherd. Man, as we pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can come together in your house, Lord. This coffee house is now church. We ask you for your Holy Spirit be here with us, Lord. We ask your blessings on everyone here. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our praises, Lord. We sing the praises to you, worship to you. Everything going on in the world, Lord, we know you've got it. You've got it. It's in control. We ask you to keep everyone safe here. We thank you for this beautiful day, for the, the congregation here today, Lord. We ask that Pastor Alice's words fall heavy on someone's heart, that they will meet and come to terms with their life, know that they need Jesus. They need Jesus in their life. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm doing part of Valerie's job, too. Well, God, I'm sorry, Valerie. I know you wagging your feet. Please stand up if you're a able, and we'll uh, we'll sing and praise the Lord. I 
about it. Think about how great is our God. How great. It just blows my mind. I can't even fathom it, and I'm not supposed to. Uh, we're just glad everyone's here today. Well, right now is about my favorite time of worship service where we can, we can uh, have prayers, requests, and praises. If anybody's got any prayer requests or praises, speak up. Hold your hand up. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Pray for them. No pain. Get rid of the pain. How about pray? I got a little praise. Let me get mine out of the way. My daughter finally graduated from school. She graduated from JCC. She got a, a degree, a associate's degree in medical coding. So she's going to be making a lot more money, so I know I can borrow some money from her. <laughs> Loan me some money, won't you, Candace? <laughs> she says yes. Now, but, uh, about later. Okay. That's enough of mine. I have a praise. Okay. Uh, I am a first time, y'all ready for this? Great grandmother. <laughs> I have a bouncing little healthy baby boy. Uh, his name is Elijah Lee. And he was born on Tuesday. He's six pounds, nine and a half ounces, and 19 and a half inches long, and a head full of black hair, and the most handsome little fella you ever did see. And yes, I'm biased. You figured that. Absolutely. Anybody else? Oh, Walter. All here for a reason. Landis, I have a praise report. Yes, ma'am. I had a medical procedure this week and had a couple of uh, snafus and roadblocks in it that I was not aware was going to happen. We're never aware of what's going to happen in the future. But the good Lord removed him. He took care of him. And uh, he's going to take care of me. And I also had a lot of good people praying for me. And I was surprised by a lot of people bringing me food. I'm not used to that. I'm used to doing it for everybody else. Because there's always other people in a lot worse off shape than what you think you might be in. You can always find somebody else a lot worse off. But long story short, God knows all of our needs, even before we have them. And he, he never, we might have to go through something bad. But you know, it's through the pain that we obtain wisdom. And it's through our weakness we get strong. And I'm never so strong. And whenever I get my weakest, God always sends me something to let me know, hey, I'm still here, and I love you. And there was a lot of people who showed me a lot of love this week that I wasn't prepared for, and I accepted it graciously, and I thank you for it. And I thank God for it, because all good and wonderful things come from him. And he loves us all, and we're all worthy of being loved. Amen. 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 Thank everyone for their prayers uh, Friday. Anyone else? I'm not probably missing somebody. You gotta hold your hand up high.
waiting for your son and your daughter to come to you and tell you all about it. And that's what we're doing here today, Lord. We come to, to give you honor, praise, and glory. You're all powerful, all wise, and all good, and you love us. You created us in your image. Oh, Father, you made a way for us to be saved and defeat that, that curse of death. And that was your son, Jesus Christ. It didn't come free. It didn't come easy. But he did it, Lord. He did it for us, for each, each person that's here, and also each person that's out those doors. Oh, Father, forgive us of our sins. Direct our paths, Lord. Give us the wisdom and the discernment that we need to do your will, Father, the boldness. Give us that peace, Lord, that passes all understanding. And, Lord, there is no understanding it. But, oh, God, it's, it's worth more than any money because when you obtain it, it can't be described. You just feel it. Instill in us so much Holy Spirit that we've got to share it with somebody else. Let us never be ashamed to stand up for you, Father. Amen. Because, Lord, this world is getting more wicked and more dismal and more crazy every day. And, Lord, we lay all these prayer requests down at your feet. There's nothing too big or nothing too small. Lord, you can handle it all. And, dear Father, we are so grateful that you love us. And we can't imagine your greatness. Lord, you do have time in your hand. And we've got, we've got today, God. Tomorrow's not promised none of us. So it's up to us what we do with it, God. Every day we wake up, it's a blessing. We have a blank sheet of paper. And what are we going to do with it? If today was our last day, Father, who will we call? What will we do? What will we do for your honor and for us, God? The Lord, we need to think about that every day. Help us to love one another, to forgive one another, to live the kind of life that is holy, Lord, and not to be ashamed to stand up for what's right. Even if you're the only person, Lord, you're always behind us and you're always beside us. So, Father... I lay it all down at the foot of the cross today. And once again, I thank you for what you've done for me this week, Lord. Thank you for all these praises. You're to be praised every day. Because every good and wonderful thing comes from you. And everything that you, you allow us to do, God, is for your glory, not for ours. Amen. Bless this church now, Lord, and every person that's here with their head bowed. And let them feel your power and your glory as they exit. Help us in our daily lives, Lord. In Jesus' sweet and holy name and for our sakes, I ask it. Amen. 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 All right, since we're already standing, say hey to your neighbor. Glad to see you here at church.
may be seated. Those songs remind me of when the praise team was Walt and myself and Sheila and Valerie. And some Sundays we outnumbered the rest of the crowd. So <laughs> we have come a long way since then. We are in Luke chapter 11 this morning. And uh, in chapter 10, Jesus had appointed 72 more disciples. And he sent them out two by two to every town that he was going to. Then afterwards, they, when they returned, Jesus continued his teaching. He first continued it with just his disciples. Then a crowd started gathering when Jesus drove out a demon. And as the crowd grew larger, he attracted some Pharisees. So in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 37... Since when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean out the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside Make the inside also. But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue, and respectful greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves where people walk over without knowing it. So this is not the first Pharisee that invited Jesus to eat with him. Back in chapter 7, we had another Pharisee where he went to his house to eat. But we have to remember that the Pharisees do not like Jesus. They do not like Jesus. Some are threatened by him because he's threatening their political and religious power. Some are jealous of him because everywhere he goes, he draws these huge crowds, and they all listen to everything he has to say. Now, the Pharisees, they just lay down heavy burdens on people uh, and, and do th that have the people do things that they would never consider even doing for themselves. A Pharisee would never have dinner with a tax collector like Jesus did, although they were profiting highly from these taxes. Another reason they hated him is because Jesus exposed them for what they really were. Before Jesus came, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, they, were, they set the moral standard for the community. They sat at the highest places in the synagogue, and they were the ones that were celebrated and honored for their virtues until Jesus came along and he exposed them. He exposed them for what they really and truly were. Some feared him for that very reason. But then we had Nicodemus that we talked about the other Sunday. He was the exception. He was the Pharisee that was intent on learning about everything Jesus had to say. So they went in, and they reclined at the table. I wish we still did that. <laughs> you recline there by the table. You eat till your belly's full. Push the plate away. Put a TV up on the china cabinet. Watch Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> That would save those 12 steps from the table to the recliner. <laughs> but so anyway, they were, return, they were 
They were reclined at the table and they started eating. And you know what? Jesus did not wash his hands. That's what they were worried about. Jesus did not wash his hands. He is here eating at our table. He did not wash his hands. And you know where, you may not believe this, but nowhere in the Bible does it say you got to wash your hands before you eat. But your mama said it. My mama said it. My mama had way, way, way less patience than Jesus did. <laughs> so you better do it. Well, the same thing happened in chapter 7, except it wasn't about hand washing. In chapter 7, it was about who Jesus let touch him. He let this woman of the night touch him back there. But see, this hand washing thing before meals, it was a ceremonial thing. In Mark chapter 7, so was washing dishes. But this is what Jesus was alluding to in these verses. In 39 and 40, when it's the Lord said to him, now, th now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people did not the one who make the outside make the inside also. He's saying that you do all this ceremonial cleansing, but inside you're just dirty. You're dirty inside. You just like washing the outside of the cup. And leaving the inside dirty. You see, they were careful to maintain the appearance of righteousness, but not the inner realities of it. They talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk. Then Jesus said, you foolish people. The word foolish here is translated from the word aphron, which means willfully ignorant. Willfully ignorant. They did not want to know or to learn anything different. We do it this way because we've always done it this way. And we're going to continue to do it this way. But then Jesus comes along and tells these people, you don't have to do it that way. Because I have a better way. You know, the early church was often called the way. Because Jesus had a better way. Verse 41, it says, but now it's for the inside. Inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Jesus is referring to the qualities of the heart. You know, a good deed is a true act of mercy. A good deed is a true act of mercy. It must be a gift that comes from inside, that comes from a loving heart. Then Jesus started a series of rebukes. In verse 42, woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kind of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the law and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. See, Jesus is speaking harshly here. Woe to you is a divine warning of condemnation. But Jesus is not criticizing them for their tithing. But the tithing, mint, row, and herbs are such little value. They're just offering them and their pleasant aroma to create an illusion of significance. What God really wants is a commitment. A commitment to the qualities of justice and love. They were so careful about their outward appearance, they were literally tithing from their herb gardens. They were counting out seeds and leaves in the herb garden and giving one-tenth to God. Verses 43 and 44 says, Woe to you, Pharisees, <clears throat> because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and the respectful greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you because you're like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. These religious men... <clears throat> would make a big deal over things that were really insignificant. They love being recognized by men. Basically, they were narcissists. It was all about me, 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 me. The best seats in the synagogue were up front facing the congregation. It would be up here. Folks, it's hard to get people to stand up here. That's where they wanted to be. They wanted to be in front of everybody. They 
They wanted to be celebrities, and they thought being spiritual was the great way to become famous. But they forgot about honor that only comes from God. I read in one commentary that the Jews would often whitewash their tombs because anyone who touches a human bone or a grave would be unclean for seven days. <clears throat> what Jesus is saying here, it's ironic that the Pharisees insist on ritual cleanliness when they themselves are like unmarked graves that render others unclean. He's talking about unmarked graves. People walk over them not knowing they were walking over an unmarked grave till they found out. And then they had to complete these seven-day rituals in order to go back into the temple to worship. But now Jesus has dealt with the Pharisees. Now starting in verse 45. One of the experts of the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, Woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourself will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you built their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others who they will persecute, <clears throat> Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have shed, has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge you yourself have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. So these, these scribes and teachers of the law, they, uh, they were teachers of the law, both the written law and the oral traditions like washing before meals. They were the associates with the Pharisees, and now, now they were objects of Jesus' criticism. By adding to these traditions, adding these traditions to Moses' law, they were just adding extra burdens, uh, uh, and burdens that they themselves could not even carry. In the book of Acts, Peter issues a similar criticism against those who insisted that you must be circumcised to be saved. But these experts glorified the past but would not help those around them in need. Instead, they only created more burdens for the common people. They built tombs for the, for the prophets to, to exhibit how religious and how reverent they were. They showed the utmost respect for the dead prophets but they rejected the living prophets. At the same time, they, they rejected the prophets as their ancestors did by approving of what their ancestors done in murdering the prophets of old. Verse 49 says, Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Jesus prophesied that these leaders would complete the rejection of of the prophets their fathers began by persecuting his disciples he would send to them. And then in 50 and 51, therefore this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be responsible for it all. This is a condemnation from Jesus to all those that are going to kill and reject the apostles that he would sin and they would face a far greater accountability. Then he spoke of the early martyrs. First of all, uh, in the Old Testament of Abel, of course, was killed by his brother uh, uh, Cain and Zechariah. In, in Genesis chapter 4, if you were in Bible study Thursday night, 
In Genesis chapter 4, you would see where Abel's blood cried out. He cried out. And in Zechariah, Zechariah, uh, in Chronicles 24, Zechariah said, May the Lord see and call you into account. And then verse 52, he says, Woe to the experts of the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourself have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. Their biggest crime here was keeping people away from God. Their legalistic approach that they had had taken away the understanding and the knowledge. By giving them a list of rules that supposedly would save them, they didn't help them at all. And as bad as it is for anyone not to enter heaven, it is far worse to hinder someone, hinder another person from entering heaven. See, the idea here is that the scribes had encrusted the word of God with the tradition of men, and therefore they kept the people from encountering the revelation of God. So they're saying here, you have to get through the works to get to the word. There's no amount of works that can get you into heaven. Matthew goes into a little more detail than Luke does in Matthew 23. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Jesus is letting these people hold it. He is not holding back. He's telling them that you're leading these people straight into hell. This is why they hate him so much. Because the truth is going to ruin their lives. This is still going on today. Instead of works, it is inclusion or total acceptance, acceptance of everything. There are so-called faith leaders out there that are nothing but false teachers. On the news last week, January 22nd, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade just up the road in Raleigh, there was a people of faith abortion rally. Y'all hear that? A people of faith abortion rally. Their rally song, they had a rally song. Access to abortion. I'm going to let it shine. Access to abortion. I'm going to let it shine. That's what they were singing. People of faith for abortion. There were women there wearing clergy robes and rainbow scarves. First of all, the Bible is very clear about the role of clergy in the church. They must be of moral character. Therefore, living a lifestyle that the Bible states is immoral and even an abomination excludes them from church leadership. Teaching and preaching that it's okay to be gay, that it's okay to have an abortion because you don't want to have a child right now, constitutes a false teacher that is talked about so much in the New Testament. With all due respect to my Catholic friends, the Pope is saying same-sex unions can now be blessed. Not marriages, unions. Unions. I would come closer to blessing a same-sex marriage than blessing a union where two people living sinful lives live together in sin. Yeah, I've already, it's a new world I know, I've already taken some heat over that stance. But what was a sin 4,000 years ago is still a sin today. God's word doesn't change just because the world does. The world is supposed to change to God's word. I can show you at least 20 examples of marriage in the Bible, and there are way more than that. I guess I should have entitled this message as a calamity is here instead of a calamity is coming. If turn over into Genesis chapter 6. Chapter 6, we're going to read verses 5 through 7.
The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil at that time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe away the face of the earth, the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. In Genesis 1.25, God looked at everything he created and he saw that it was good. And then in verse 26, he created man. He created man. Then somewhere about 1,650 years later, he regretted everything that he had made. He had created, he regretted everything he had made. What do you think he is thinking now? They were so full of sin back then. Now we've got all this technology. We can, we can even create new sins. What do you think God is thinking now when he looks down upon the world and sees what is going on? Now over in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, if you want to turn there. I was watching a, a preacher on... on I don't know what it was on. It was online somewhere this week. And he was talking about how his wife told him to slow down because he would give them the scripture and they would still be turning and he'd be finished reading the scripture. <laughs> so I'm giving you time to turn to Matthew 27. <laughs> 37 through 30, 39. It said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took away them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is referring here uh, to the days of Noah and how wicked the world was. Everyone was just going about their own business. They were just... You know, trolling along doing whatever they wanted to do. They were living their lives as if nothing evil would ever happen. And they knew nothing about what was going on until Noah entered the ark. When Noah entered the ark, God shut the door and the rain started falling. This is how it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. This passage tells us that the coming, the returning of Jesus is going to be a surprise for a lot of people because they're just going along their lives, living their lives however they want to live it. It's going to be, it's going to surprise a lot of people. God, tell, God tells Noah to build an ark because he's going to destroy the world. He's going to send a worldwide flood. They had no respect for God. They chose to indulge in their sinful natures and worship first gods instead of looking for the Lord to repent. They were wicked and they were unashamed of their actions. God sent us a rainbow to let us know he would never flood this world again. That rainbow he sent us has been hijacked. As we look forward to his return, when we will be called up in heaven, what's going to happen next is this world will be destroyed by fire. The earth, the elements, and everything in it will be destroyed by fire and laid bare. There's your global warming, folks, right there. If you don't want to die that way, you don't want to die that way. You need to accept Jesus today. If you have never accepted Jesus, you know, everything in that Bible is true. Everything that was, that was predicted back in the Old Testament has already come. It's history now because it happened. Everything prophesied in the New Testament 
that hasn't already happened will come to happen, will come to pass. So if everybody would bow their head, close their eyes just for a minute. I want to give you the opportunity to come up here and worship at this altar. You can kneel down to pray. You can be just you and God. I can pray with you. If you have never accepted Christ, I pray that right now will be the day you do it. Because we are not guaranteed tomorrow. And today is the day of salvation. The Bible says anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The praise team is going to sing a verse in the chorus. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Everybody's heart clear, everybody's heart good, everybody okay with the Lord? Amen. Amen. Let's see. Do we have announcements? Do we have announcements? I don't know if we have announcements or church not. Dinner, yes, Sunday. we have church dinner. A week from Tuesday, church dinner. Uh at Big Ed's. Uh Bible study, Thursday night, seven PM at Aversboro Road Baptist Church. We're in Genesis. Good place to start, folks. It's been a long time since I studied the book of Genesis, and it is a great study. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, Sisters of Street meeting February 4th right here at Lorraine's. And I guess I guess that's it for everything good, everybody good. All righty. That's right. We'll worship with our offerings on the way out this morning. The, the, the basket is there on the table. Well, let's sing a song. To be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary.
Lord, we thank you that you're a sanctuary for us, Father. Lord, help us to sing out the words of those songs that we just sang. Help us to be a sanctuary to a lost and dying world, not just in this building, Father, but when we leave here. Lord, we're the, we're the clean outside of the cup here now, Father. We've got to go out there and clean the inside. Lord, put somebody in front of us this week that will tell us, we can tell about Jesus and what he's done in our life. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Y'all love each other on the way out.